Hey, everybody. Um, I am here with uh, Dr. Saxena and so excited to bring you today the topic. We were just gabbing a little before, that's why we're just a little late to get started, about our topic today. And it's we're going to dive into some of the really important components we have both learned, not only personally, but professionally, about healing and embracing not just the masculine driven to do list. Um, protocolized healing energy, but going more into this, how do we connect in social situations? How do we embrace our feminine energy? How do we embrace our intuition and medicine? I am so excited to talk about this topic today. It's so relevant. So you are in for a treat. Uh, before we dive in, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. You can find um, all kinds of resources and free blogs at my website, jillcarnahan.com. And if you want any products, you can find those at drjillhealth.com. We are live on uh, YouTube on my channel under my name. There's over almost 80 interviews now. And we're also live on iTunes and Stitcher and all of the places that you find podcasting. So you can find us and listen to all the other episodes. And there's uh, pretty much a new one coming out every week. So I first want to introduce my colleague. Um, we have just been in the same circles for probably a decade um, with IFM and A4M and all the different organizations that teach functional medicine. She has been just a leader and um, someone I look up to in this realm. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about her journey and some of the things she's doing that are unique to medicine. Um, she is a board certified family practice physician whose passion and purpose came to life through sharing her innovative patient education and practice management solutions in her classic keep it simple style. I love that. <laughs> she serves as faculty with the Institute of Functional Medicine and the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. She also serves as clinical expert um, for CM Vitals program at the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. Dr. Saxena is an expert in the group visit medical model. We'll talk a little bit about that and uh, creator of group visit toolkits and co-author of the Ingredients Matter India. She currently serves as Chief Medical Officer of Forum Health, a nationwide network of functional and integrative physicians committed to bringing the health and the care into our healthcare industry. She, as you can tell, is a game changer, a leader, and I am totally honored to be with you today. Dr. Saxena, welcome. Thank you so much. I am just beyond happy to have this conversation uh, with you and with everybody who's listening. Really, I think it's gonna be very intuitive and hopefully inspiring. Yeah, and we were just saying, uh, I love how we roll because at, most of you who listen, you know, I don't ever have an agenda. I often ask people if they have some questions to send me beforehand and most of the time I forget to look at them. <laughs> so I love this whole energy of just showing up, being present and seeing where things go, having an idea, but that's where we're going today. I love to start with a little bit about your story and your journey into medicine, like what drove you that way and what direction and turns it took. So if you want to start by just sharing a little bit of that, um, that'd be amazing. Sure. Well, I have this stereotypical story. I'm a firstborn child of an immigrant family of Asian Indian descent. And so you may have heard that many times we are directed to become doctors or engineers or something. So I actually wanted to be an artist. And my father very conveniently said, that's nice. You're going to be a doctor. So, you know, I went into medicine. I really did enjoy being with people. And I chose family medicine because I was really indecisive about which part of the body I liked. In fact, I liked all parts of them. And I couldn't imagine as a creative spirit kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again. So family medicine chose me. And I particularly loved taking care of, I mean, I used to deliver babies. I'm an FPOB by training. So I love the idea of the continuum of life, helping people, you know, from the time that they are in the womb and nurturing the mother so that the baby is healthy all the way to the end portions of life, if you will. I did that and I really thought I was in the business of healing when I was in training. I really was like, okay, we're gonna heal people. Here's the magic. And then residency slowly became like this awakening, like, wait a second, there's a lot of other factors that are going on besides a pill for every ill. So I graduated and worked in an underserved area in uh, North Jacksonville. So it was where rural and urban underserved came together. And what I found out very quickly was, goodness, there is like a, a machine that's happening with medicine. And that was really dissatisfying. In fact, I kind of jokingly said, I feel like a legalized drug dealer, like just every few months people come in, 
they get their refills. And, you know, in this population, they even had something that the name of the visit was called a Lexus refill. It was a Lortab, a Xanax, or a Soma. And wow. it, was, it was called a Lexus refill. I'm like, this is bad when we, when yeah. we have a name for the type of visit. So I said, okay, this doesn't work for me. I opened my own practice in 2000. And just to clarify for those listening, if we have, a, I mean, basically sleeping pill, antidepressant, and what was the third one? A pain pill. Yeah. So, so just to clarify, okay, pain, sleeping pill or antidepressant and you're out the door. Right. I mean, that's kind of how it came down to totally understand. And sadly the state and what people maybe don't know is in medical training. I mean, we had the best training in the world. We are an allopathic. And if you have trauma, heart disease, or any of these things, that's where you want to go. But the difficulty is in medical school, we're taught to give a label. And then there's a, um, a one treatment, usually a drug. There's not a lot of thought as to what happened. Why did it happen? And I'll let you continue the story, but that's the background because we weren't really taught anything different, but you and I, and anyone else who is a little bit more awake starts to wonder, is this really why I went into medicine? Right? Exactly. Yeah. I have a funny way of remembering it. It's like, we named it, we blamed it like, Oh, it's the diabetes that's doing this too. Yeah. We treat it. And then we street it like, okay, I'll see you in three months. Like name it, blame it, treat it, street it. And that's what <laughs> we kept doing. And it seemed like we were making a difference until again, we awoke to, Hey, what's the difference between what I learned about being healthy and then the disease, what's the big space in between for how you went from one stage to another. That's, I didn't know that was called functional and integrative medicine, honestly, at the time. So I started my practice and many of my patients who came to see me were taking supplements. And I thought I've not learned a single thing about supplements and Growing up as an Asian Indian in an immigrant's home, like we used turmeric and ginger, we had all these concoctions and kinds of things that my mother would give me if I was ill. So I wasn't close minded to people taking supplements, I just was ignorant to it. And what I noticed was they were very cautious about telling me as though like, you know, they were doing some illegal activity, right. and I was going to scold them or something like that. And so I said, no, I really need to know everything that's going in your mouth, whether it's pharmaceutical or supplement, because that's the only way I can give you the best, you know, uh, recommendation. So I started researching supplements on my patient's behalf and got open to this whole other world because these patients were smart. They weren't just like, Hey, I saw this infomercial. They were bringing me clinical trials and published papers. And I thought, where was all this yeah. in my training? And so I started doing training and um, at the Institute for Functional Medicine. And then I just completely got sucked into this is the missing piece. This right. is what I've always been thinking I was going to be doing as a doctor. Um, and it's just been a whirlwind, yeah. like just adventure, fun, fulfillment ever since. We always joke kind of like we get the virus, right? Like we get infected with yes. that. kind of interesting nowadays to say that, but like when yes. you get the function and, and like you and myself and so many other practitioners like ourselves that I've heard, we know in our hearts, what we wanted to do, why we went into medicine. But at the time, at least for me and you, we didn't know the name. And then we discovered, oh, this is what I've been, I, I've known in my heart that ever since I went into medicine, this is the kind of medicine I wanted to practice. I just didn't know there was a term and a name and an education. And like you, I dove full fledged, never to look back into functional and integrative medicine for that reason. Yes. It's so much sad, more satisfying really, because you get to really dig deep and solve problems and all the things that we enjoy as practitioners. Absolutely. And I actually had a personal thing going on because most of us have a personal physical challenge that we're also kind of putting through the allopathic model and we're hitting roadblocks. If it's not us, it's usually someone that we care for who's not getting somewhere with the name it, blame it, treat it, street model. So I was dealing with infertility at, uh, at age 28. And mind you, at that time, I was in residency delivering babies of 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds on average. Mm -hmm. And I was really wondering when I was going to the reproductive endocrinologist, like, seriously, like, why can't you figure out what's going on with me? I'm eating well, I'm eating well, yeah. uh, exercising. I thought I was doing all eating my low carb tortillas, like doing all what I thought was healthy based on my training. And they couldn't figure out what it was. They named it PCOS. It was the closest thing that it was. And, and that, and I went through a, probably what I would look back and say a depression 
at that phase. I didn't know it because that wasn't a terminology that my culture really allowed me to explore. It was more of a suck it up, be strong, like get warrior about this. Um, and that's, we're going to be talking about that here in yes. a second. Uh, <laughs> so I just kind of worked through it. And it, but at that time, I am sure that there was a seed that was planted about what was missing in the model that was, that I was being trained in and what would, I won't say fail me, but it surely didn't create the long-term solution I was seeking for. So that when people started talking to me about supplements and how it was helping them with things that pills did not help, I was ready because that was planted early. I, I'm, I'm positive that if I had a healthy child from the get-go and you know I didn't go through any medical issues, I would look at other people who were taking supplements and or like bucking the system. Yeah. And I would say like, come on, you're yeah. crazy. I'm sure I would. Yeah. I was trained to think that way. Totally. I couldn't agree more. It said that like the opening and as many people know, I had cancer at 25 and I had to do the same thing as like, okay, well, first of all, why did this happen at 25? And second of all, I, I went the conventional way for treatment, but how do I recover from all that toxicity that it created? And it's the same thing. We have our journeys. And, and when we find our system that we were trained in has amazing things about it, but there are some limitations. And when we buck up against those limitations, then we, of course, if we're uh, open-minded, we're looking for more answers. So love that journey. And yes, you set us up so well, because you <laughs> talked about, and I just, I think back, so we're going to talk a little bit about masculine, feminine energy, and some of the healing things about this. And I want to clarify, this isn't male or female. This is like, we all have both and embracing those in equal degrees is important because often we come out in, in one way or the other, a little bit tilted. And you mentioned this, it sounds like our stories are similar. Most of us that go into medicine are very driven, very, very goal oriented, very ambitious. Uh, I used to have these five, 10 year plans and lists and all of those things. And I always joke with another colleague of mine in the beginning, when I spoke, you and I have been speaking for 10, 15 years or more. Um, I would wear the black pantsuit because it was this male dominated, you know, and I laugh now because I would never be caught dead in a black pantsuit. I always would now wear dresses and flowing and very feminine, but it took me a while to be, uh, how do we say it? Like feel confident enough in myself to actually realize number one, I can be a badass and also a delicate flower, yeah. <laughs> right? Like you can still be, have that driven energy, but like I can embrace the feminine in healing and in a, a showing up in the world and actually that approach is much more uh, connected. It's more intuitive. And some of our um, greatest discoveries, as far as for me, find problem solving in medicine is, is embracing that part because it brings a sense of um, the gut uh, feeling and some of those things. Tell, tell me more about your thoughts on this, because this is such an interesting topic to me. You know, uh, oh gosh, like, where can we start? So I know. <laughs> number one, I think I was trained to interface with patients in a very masculine way. Like what is their chief complaint? Yep. What is the history of present illness? Like how much pain, when did it start? Like very linear, very black and white. There was, you know, we had our soap notes, which is the, yeah. the order in which you ask your questions and document your note. And, you know, feminine energy knows that people don't talk according to our note structure, you know? So when I would see patients and they would, you know, want to talk about something that wasn't in the order of the way I was meant to document, there were times that I would initially guide them back, if you will, to that protocol method. Right. I'm like, okay, my assessment and my plan. Right. <laughs> At some point I realized this, I'm losing connection with this person because I'm being too structured. And there was this flow and this intuition that I was ignoring because there were certain things they were saying that I wanted to explore, yeah. but I wouldn't because it wasn't part of the linear algorithm I was supposed to follow. Now, listen, there are times when the linear algorithm is the way to go. Like if somebody's having chest pain, right. I'm going to stay linear because it's an urgent kind of situation, urgent, emergent, but there are many times. Our when house managing, yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. So I realized that what people really wanted was to be heard. Like half of the healing is in the listening mm -hmm. of who you are. And it's just natural. I was a big sister. Uh, I loved educating just from a, a standpoint of being the person in my family that bridged the the cultural connect between 
our roots and this whole new way of living in America. So I loved learning about people and they loved that I was interested in just being open to whatever their intuition said. And that was a very feminine aspect of me showing up, even though I didn't know it as feminine. I just thought it was polite and respectful and really genuinely caring to see what they thought, which was not part of our medical training. Yeah. It was more like get a history, not connect. Yeah. And, and what we were taught is, okay, you get this history very clinically a linear. Um, and then you take that, you do tests to scientifically prove what you think could be d- the differential, which means the different types of things that it could be as far as diagnosis. And then you come to a conclusion and present that and present a treatment, just linear X, Y, Z. What you're describing is much more of this, first of all, holding space, creating a safe place for that person to share. Um, and I know you and I both were taught in medical school that you need to remain objective. You must not share personal stories. You must not never shed a tear. Right. And I remember like I'm emotional and engaged. And, and when I started being okay with actually expressing my own emotion or expressing compassion with a tear once in a while, if it, if it came or, um, just, uh, being so open to let them kind of go and lead me versus me lead them. The magic happens there because number one, they start to really feel heard and seen and human connection, which is what we'll talk about as well is the foundation of healing. So when they feel, honestly, you've seen the studies and we don't need studies to tell us this, but it's that connection, that trust that actually starts the healing process with your practitioner. And if you're listening out there, you all have examples of great experiences where you, all you did was you cried because you felt heard for the first time in your life by a practitioner who listened to you and took you seriously and didn't downplay your concerns. And then you've had, as I have other practitioners who literally in and out, maybe five minutes, seven minutes. And you just left like completely confused. Like what just happened? I don't think they even know my name, let alone why I'm here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like handled almost. Uh, Yeah. And I do think, you know, I've, it's interesting, like how things happen in your life. If, if you are open to seeing how, if you will, God or the universe or nature guides you, whatever the belief system is, I just started reading um, and studying the work of Dr. Stephen Porges, and he has a whole kind of field of study he's been working on for decades called polyvagal theory. And what it says is that humans, basically for treatment to work, they must first feel safe. Oh, yes. Because if they don't feel safe, the, the natural autonomic, which is that kind of automatic nervous system that alerts you like danger, danger. If they, if your autonomic system senses danger, danger, then healing, even if it's the right treatment doesn't have a chance to get integrated because it's like your body knows, like beware. And I think what feminine energy is so wonderful at is that nurturing response that says you're safe with me. And when you create that, which I think many of the times is because a person feels heard. And what I use the term is recreated, like not just I'm listening, but I am processing and saying back to you what I believe you're saying and your intuition and your words matter to me. Like what you think is going on matters to me. So then all of a sudden the patient feels safe Mm-hmm. And if I do, if I create that space, like you mentioned for a patient and then initiate treatment a, yeah. and let's say another practitioner initiates treatment a, but yeah. doesn't create the safety space, yes. the data shows that the person will get better with me. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it's the same treatment. Love that. And don't you find too, I find all the time, of course, we're learning, I learn every day for my patients. And it's often like the time where they're like a little, like if they have the safe spot that we've created where we're listening and really wanting them to hear what they have to say. And then we say, sometimes I'm sure you say this too, well, what do you think is going on? And yes. they often hesitate and they're like a little bit like, well, you might think I'm crazy or, but this kind of makes me wonder about X, Y, or Z. And you know what? So many times they are right on, but they're scared to say, or they're a little bit, or they've been made to feel bad about this strange thing they're thinking, except it's not strange at all. And I so often find if we just listen, the patients really know themselves, they know what's going on and we can be as a guide and maybe with more experience in whatever realm we're dealing with, but it's so powerful, isn't it? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you've been around as long as I have in healthcare, where it used to be called doctor's orders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> doctor's orders. You must do this. You must do this. Like, here's your prescription, doctor's orders. And then it became like culturally doctor's recommendations. Uh -huh. Okay. But recommendations really is just a softer version of doctor knows best. In right. 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 And so now it's shared decision making or informed decision making where finally yeah. we recognize, hey, patients have a tremendous amount of understanding potential if we just actually partner with them versus have this hierarchical doctor patient kind of space. So just even in the language, we are shifting from a male energy, like patriarchal orders. Yes. It kind of got a little bit into the feminine with recommendations, but I think this shared decision-making is the center of feminine energy. Oh, I love that. And that's exactly. So two things I'm thinking, I want to talk about your, you have been a pioneer with group visits and this has been a game changer. You've been teaching it to other physicians. I want to go there in just a minute before we do practically speaking, say someone out there is listening and they're like, I, Dr. Sexton and Dr. Carnahan, you, I have had so many bad experience with doctors. I, you know, I've been ignored. I've been told I just need an antidepressant. I um, mean, you guys listening, know you've been there. What would you talk to the patient as far as advocating for them and how could they show up? Not that it's all their responsibility, but what tools could we give a patient who's been struggling with this, not either feeling heard or safe or seen and some of the things we're talking about. I think number one, to be prepared with what you know and be confident about what you know, you might take an extra step and do some research and bring it to the doctor, especially, or the, you know, the nurse practitioner or physician assistant, because they may be stuck in a model where they really do only have five to 10 minutes with you. So as a partner, come prepared with what you think might be a set of options for the provider to consider along with you, as opposed to coming and just kind of, if you will, dumping on the provider and then just hoping they figure it out. So because, you know, on the flip side of it, there is this whole thing called provider burnout from this responsibility of quote unquote, having to fix and protect like a very male energy burnout kind of thing. So I think being prepared, being an advocate for yourself, coming to the table as a partner is great. Now, you might do all that and you still have someone who's not willing to participate as a partner, does not really honor your word, you don't feel a connection, you don't feel safe, then I think it would make sense to go find someone that you do because just with the research as we're pointing out and just from experience, treatments are just may, may not stick if you don't feel safe with this person. And, you know, there's so many great ways on social media to find out those practitioners that are great listeners. Obviously, I would direct you to a functional and integrative medicine provider because that's what we're trained in. Part of what we do as functional medicine practitioners is one, identify and address the underlying cause. But number two is in the context of a therapeutic partnership. Like those are the two principles, not just find the root cause, but then partner with the patient. So find one of us. There's many different directories at IFM, AFRM that you can just look up, you know, what, what you're searching for as an expertise. And I would say, go to the websites and get a sense of the flavor. Your intuition is strong. Mm. Trust what it, I'm, I'm getting a little star Wars about this, but like <laughs> just trust your Jedi instincts. You know, honestly, though, that's the root, like we're talking about love and acceptance and safety, number one. So not only loving, trusting yourself, but that trusting your intuition we're talking about as practitioners, how powerful it is when we model that trusting our intuition in a direction for patients. But we're saying the same, if you're a patient looking for trust your intuition, and if you don't first find the answers, your doctor says, Hey, your labs are all normal. Come back in a year. I don't see anything wrong. And here's a sleeping medicine, a pain medicine, or antidepressant. <laughs> uh, not that those are inappropriate at times. We have no problem with that. But again, if there's a deeper thing, trust your intuition and keep looking, don't give up. And then the second thing is that um, just finding that space where you feel heard, it doesn't have to be an hour visit. It could be a shorter visit, but just a space where you feel heard. And practically we're both involved with IFM and A4M. You can go to IFM.org, um, search A4M. Both of those have um, practitioner um, links and resources. So you 
you can actually search by zip code and find docs that are in your area. And I would totally agree. That's usually where I send people as well. Um, so group visits, you have been such a pioneer in this. And of course, um, love this. Tell us, first of all, what does the research show around the power of groups and healing? And then what's practical ways uh, for either patients to find groups or what do you do in your clinic? Just tell us a little bit about group visits. Yes. So I, I want to just preface it to say like, this is common sense, mm -hmm. whether you are a patient or a provider, I'm sure, you know, the community is medicine, like from personal experience, you know, whether you're on a softball team or at a church, there's something powerful about group. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about group in healthcare. So in conventional medicine, which is that allopathic model that Jill and I were both trained in, what we started realizing is, is that when a group comes together and is able to share their successes and or struggles about whatever topic, somehow the people who are in the group are smarter. So they have higher knowledge scores. They have better outcomes because somehow in the sharing, there is more what we call self-efficacy, like a sense that I can do it. Yes. That starts to rise. And then because there's more time in a group medical appointment, there's just more space for more questions to be answered. And so there's just this compliance thing that just happens because you don't have to come back for a second and third and fourth appointment to find out, excuse me, is there gluten in wine? Like, you know, that's a funny thing that people will ask, you know, when they, when you go gluten-free, but these little questions, having the answers to them make the difference. And then being with other people who have similar questions somehow makes you feel not alone. You're like, oh, so I'm not, I'm not crazy. This is a valid question. Okay. Susie wanted to know that answer too. So there's a self-confidence that's building. There's also like humor that happens when people are joking about like, you know, the, oh, it's so hard being gluten-free if let's say that's what the group visit yeah. is about. So there's something in the sharing that improves outcomes, not only in conventional medicine, but there was a landmark study that the Center for Functional Medicine did where they proved that functional medicine delivered in a group format mm -hmm. did better than individual appointments as it related to lifestyle and really addressing the root cause. So community is medicine, full stop period. So the question is, how can you create community, whether it's in your medical office or even like a group of friends that are all committed to, we're all going gluten free. Yeah. Or we're all going to eat anti-inflammatory for a month. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that's why organizations like Weight Watchers for years have had so much success because they get people into connection in groups. And this is key. So um, two questions. First of all, how do you do that in your practice? Like what would that look like in just a nutshell for people to, uh, and then how would patients find something like that? That, that might be the other question. Yeah. So it, with Forum Health, what we did was we have a national network of physicians. And so we started creating Zoom groups. Love and it. We have, yeah. So all of our providers would uh, refer into these Zoom groups that were run by myself and a health coach. So we have one right now all around mental health using amino acids as neurotransmitter fuel makers, if you will. We teach people about brain health, neurotransmitters. And literally we all gather on zoom and what's beautiful is, is this is a mental health topic. And on zoom, people can hide by video. They can change their name so that they can be superwoman as you know, we tell yeah. them <laughs> name yourself a superhero or your favorite color, whatever you want. And then if they have a question, they can actually privately chat the health coach who will then bring up the question, but now the person didn't have to raise their hand in a physical audience, because that's what we did pre COVID. Mm -hmm. People would gather in our lobby and I would have hummus and crudite and like cucumber mint water. Right. You know, I would kind of create the old school group kind of uh -huh. meeting, but it's interesting, especially around certain topics like mental health, the virtual group is working well. And we, we offer that to non-patients to come in and do our uh, programs because we really do want people to access the benefit of group. It, it's going to take a while before like healthcare all of a sudden is doing a ton of group medical appointments. So this is a way people can dabble in it and really get community as another therapeutic tool. 
I love that because the thing about the pandemic that's really helped is it really has expanded whether we can see, I mean, I've always seen people virtually after an initial in-person visit, but um, it's really broadened medicine in general to be more open to these virtual visits. And then second, you can have a group that's all over the United States. I mean, you can have people from all over now that's much easier without travel. And um, and so interesting too, because different you know areas of the US are seeing things differently. And I think it brings such a wide perspective, I'm sure. Um, that's so- oh, yes. And a oneness, because yeah. when somebody in Florida is mm-hmm. in a group with someone in Utah and Illinois, and they see like, oh, they have the same questions I do. Exactly. It's been so affirming to people to know, like, I'm not alone. And oh. that's that connection piece, that belongingness, that social health ingredient. I mean, social health is just as important as broccoli. <laughs> oh, I love that. that is, <laughs> that's a beautiful sound by social health is as important as broccoli. I love that. Um, in fact, if we promote this, I think we're going to put that as your quote. quote. That transition. That's a brilliant quote. Honestly, it's really good. I, I love it. I'm being serious. I think, um, but that transitions into this other thing and we can maybe start to wrap up on this note. We've been in a pandemic and we thought it was over and it's not, and this is our life. And um, I know that there's been so much um, stress on our patients. I remember in the very beginning thinking, I have no problem with the protocols, with the, all of the things we did to keep people safe. But I remember thinking at the very beginning, isolation is not good for people. This could be so dangerous and we're seeing extended. Now, granted, many people are able to get out and about in safe ways. Um, however, there's still patients I know that haven't left their house in nine months or 12 months. Talk a little bit about the unintended consequences of isolation on our health and and how that's because I'm seeing and I'm sure you are. We are in a pandemic now of mental health issues because the isolation and we have to think of all these things again, not at the expense of safety, but let's talk about isolation and how it does affect us. Yeah. So I think that we always knew that loneliness and isolation wasn't a great human nutrient. I mean, humans are social beings. So the CDC has actually amassed some data that shows that loneliness and isolation will increase your risk for all diseases, all diseases. And just for an example, heart disease and stroke, uh, being lonely and isolated increases your risk by 29%, 29%. Mm. So we used to say that sitting is the new smoking, right? Like sitting for eight hours a day. I want to say that social isolation, you know, is right up there as a risk factor and isolation to me is not necessarily just being physically isolated, but it's being, if you will, like, um, socially in the sense, like you, you're not a part of a group, you're not a part of a community, you're not a part of a bigger one. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because there's many people who can still stay connected virtually, if they still feel comfortable, if you will, hunkering down yeah. in their house for nine months. But, you know, if you're Facebooking and you're Zooming and you're this, you, you reduce the impact of loneliness and social isolation. Yeah. That's good. And that's important. And of course we have <laughs> with a little stretching and yoga and that in between your sitting and then, we, yes. <laughs> right. Oh, good. Um, this is so important. And I hope those of you who are listening um, are able to take some of this and find a practitioner that you trust, that you can have some of that intuitive energy that you can bring new information to and partner with uh, just so critical in your own healing journey. Um, lastly, I often ask my guests, um, what would you say has been your biggest victory in the last year or two? Like, what would you say again? We've had kind of a tough year, but tell us a little bit about your victories or what's something that you're, um, proud to have gotten through or accomplished in this last bit? Oh, this is just a lovely question. I'm going to be a little personal here on this one. You know, um, this pandemic, I think, has created a lot of new challenges for all people. And I really thought that my biggest challenge was going to be, okay, how am I going to be a physician in the COVID pandemic with people frantic, scared, you know, mad, irritated, all these things that people are showing up at our office. I thought that was going to be my biggest challenge. However, in my personal world, my youngest sister has a medical condition that the trauma of what is happening has created a worsening to where we were in the emergency room with her 15 to 20 times during the early parts of the pandemic. And 
if you remember those days, it was like yeah. once you left the ER, you had to go through like a hazmat sequence before, yeah. you know, you went back into your house and then you would quarantine that poor person yeah. for X amount of days before they were allowed to come out and even talk to someone, you know, like yes. voluntary confinement. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And um and and what I what I what my biggest success in this last year is being with situations that I cannot fix. Yes. Okay. Like just trusting that there's some richness Mm -hmm. in the pain or some richness in this friction and just being with it because my automatic, if you will, male energy is got to fix it. Got to figure out what's going on with my sister. Must protect her. Oh, I'm the doctor. Like how bad it looks. If I can't even solve her issue, I'm supposedly a functional medicine doctor. I'm supposedly a teacher of this. Like who are like all that imposter second guessing of yourself had. And it did like come up moment to moment. And my biggest, my biggest success is being able to be with that and say like, okay, I get that you're thinking that right now and that's okay, but we're going to take a new action today and let's hope it makes a difference. And if not, we'll deal with that. And that's been huge to just be with uncertainty and change. I love that. I'm almost in tears just listening to you because this is so relevant to everybody listening. And what you did is just bring verbiage and be out there on the stuff that all of us are feeling. And you know what? It fits so well as we end our conversation today, because today, because the old same journey as you, I could just say the same story, this surrender to um, not knowing the answer all the time to the uncertainty and to trusting that it will work out. And then in the journey, in the suffering, in the difficulty, there are jewels <laughs> to be had if we don't miss picking them up along the way. Like if we, if we let go of that, I'm supposed to must all of those words that are all masculine, right? And we surrender and say, what is here that is precious? Like maybe your relationship, your sister is probably closer (laughs) and same with me, right? Like, so there are these precious jewels. And I think this is relevant to you listening, because I think at some extent, every one of you out there is suffering in some way. There's just challenges right now. So thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing because it's very relevant to every single one of us. And I just encourage you, if you're listening, um, as difficult as your situation might be, look for the jewels because they're there to be found. And it's almost like we have to put on those glasses, not rose colored glasses and ignore the difficulty, but the glasses that say, what else is possible? What is here? That's actually a benefit to my life and my psyche and my relationships. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. It's so relevant to every one of us. Oh, thank you for bringing this all out. Like you just modeled the feminine energy beautifully right here, right? In this conversation, you created space for me to be safe about saying that. Because listen, I could have said something very male energy and I don't mean to be kind of bad thing. I don't mean to be kind of bad thing. Yeah, like I was a chief medical officer and our business grew. Right, right. It's a great thing. Like, thank goodness I have the male energy to be able to do that as well too. Um, So I'm proud of that too, but- Right. Uh, you created the space for my feminine achievement, if you will, my feminine energy achievement to show up. Thank you. And again, we hopefully allowed those of you listening to feel the same. I mean, because again, you touched me by sharing. Um, thank you for your time, for your beautiful heart. Um, loved talking to you today so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure to be with you. You're welcome.